This is Megapine. Megapine. M I P. With Masamela Matsumo. Mark Thompson. Megapine. Get woke. Ladies and gentlemen, happy Black Women's Equal Pay Day. And we say happy Black Women's Equal Pay Day, not because we've reached Black Women's Equal Pay, but because we are hopeful to it. And we want to celebrate this day, not by being still, but by moving and being active. Who better to talk to about this subject than moms rising in the person of senior vice president, Monifa Bandelay. Monifa, how are you? Happy Black Women's Equal Pay Day. I'm doing well. Thank you for celebrating us and acknowledging this unequal pay. Yeah. So so talk to us about that. Where, where do we stand now? Because I, I believe in years past, we've talked about how many fewer cents on the dollar Black women make than others. Is that number changing? Is it static? Is it is it getting worse? What, what's the latest? Yeah, the number, the gap is actually widening between um, Black women and white women in terms of the comparison to white men's pay. So today is Black Women's Equal Pay Day because last year, for every $1 that a white man made, um, Black women made 58 cents. So we had to work an extra eight months to catch up to that dollar. And that makes today Black Women's Equal Pay Day. Equal Pay Day for all women across the board was in April. But when we break it down by race, Black women, Indigenous women, Latinx women um, are getting paid much less than our white counterparts. That's, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if memory serves, at one time, you, it's 58 now, like a couple of years ago, wasn't it 60 cents? Yeah. That's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, so, it's gone, I, yeah. Mm-hmm. so you're right, it is, it is gone down. Do, do we know... Why? I mean, and 58 ain't really much worse than 60, but I'm just curious. Do we know where the other two cents went? Do we have any sense of that? We did see that this gap increased under the pandemic. The jobs uh, that uh, Black women hold, um, we saw them getting paid less. There was less job stability, had to move around within industries. And so you kind of more at the starting point and not, you know, as you go year to year, you get Uh, wage increases. And the reality is that the intersection of racism and sexism in the hiring practice in the workplace is still persistent. Right. And so those those gaps, those gaps are widening And the industries that we dominate, especially in the care industries, have really suffered under the pandemic. So you have the triple whammy. So you have the racism, you have sexism and then you had a global pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, one of the things as, as I was covering jobs and employment or lack thereof during the pandemic, I always found interesting. And I wondered if, if, if um, you can speak to this as well. We, we sort of did. So, so black women were, black women actually, from what I saw during the pandemic, actually suffered the greatest job losses proportionately during the pandemic, correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah. And and talk us a bit more about why that is. Is that be- because of the industries Black women were in, or, or is there more to it than that? So it's two factors. One are the industries that we dominate. So you're talking about the service industry, right? So let's say when everything shuts down, all the service delivery, you know, restaurants, your grocery stores, um, places where things kind of went very low, Black women were in those industries. And because of, like I said, the intersection of racism, when it comes time to shrink the workforce, who suffers, right? Who's cut the most? We, we, we face those types of um, cuts disproportionately. So those two things kind of work together, both the type of industry we're in, but then across all industries, as industries had to shrink during the pandemic, you saw that the people being cut the most uh, were Black women um, and many of our other uh, women of color counterparts and white women fared a little better. Also, what you saw is that Black women were more likely to get sick with COVID, experiencing COVID uh, morbidity and mortality, more likely to die. 
And so in our industries like nursing and places, teachers, places where we were coming into contact with a lot of folks, we were also suffering from inadequate health care, being sicker, um, and all of those things impacted how we shrank. But I do want to point out that Black women's participation in the labor force is higher than any other demographic of women in the country. Black women participate in the labor force at 60.2%. A lot of times when people talk about wage discrimination and women in workforce, they have this thing where they say, as women began to come into the women, into the workforce, and like as women's participation in the labor force increased, and what people fail to realize is that Black women, I know if we think back to our moms and our grandmothers, they always work. They worked at home just like all the other women, but then we also always had other jobs, you know, whether it was doing the same things we do at our house and other people's houses, uh, working in factories, doing things to um, help our families stay afloat. And that persists to, to this day. So while we face greater discrimination and getting cuts, we are more likely to be in the workforce as women, Black women. But then on top of that, Black women at 70% are the sole breadwinners for their families. So we're more likely to be the only person bringing in income. And then uh, 17% of us are co-income earners. So you have very few Black women who are uh, stay-at-home moms, so to speak, you know, for lack of a better term, because of, again, the wage discrimination that our whole community of family face, right? So we have to make up for the wage discrimination that um, whether it's Black men that we live with or other Black women that we live with by also working as well and putting those uh, resources together to keep our families afloat. You, you pro- I think you anticipated my next question when you said co-income workers. What was that percentage again of co-income workers? Yes. Yeah, so the co-income is <clears throat> 14.7% are what they call Co breadwinners. So you have seventy point seven percent of Black mothers. This is specifically are the sole income earners, and then you have about fifteen percent that co income earn. Yeah, and and to be clear, you mentioned who that co might be. Look, and and people know my history. I my household as a child was my mother and my grandmother. They were both working. That was the co income. That's the COVID. <laughs> and, and, and I know some other situations today where it's the mother and the grandmother or the mother and not, you know, part of that extended family working together to um, um, to raise children. Um, and, you know, I mean, we're hearing more and more that that many of the breadwinners, if not the majority overall <laughs> in this country the primary breadwinners in the household of women. So, you know, if that's true for other cultures and for white women, it's got to be true for us because that's that's been the case with our people for some time. But but I'm looking at another number and, and I don't know if, if this is accurate. So you mentioned the 58 cents. Is there a different number for mothers specifically when it comes to how many cents on the dollar? Yes, I'm glad you asked. Okay. Come on. <laughs> for black mothers, when you compare to white dads is 52 cents because there is a discrimination that you face when it's known that you are a caregiver, right? Um, Both in hiring, you'll hear women, particularly going into certain professions, say they don't say they have children because they think the person won't hire them because they may need to leave early, pick up kids from school, or they're relegated to lower positions in the company because of a potential for their caregiving obligations outside of work and at home. So you see an even wider wage gap. And that's true across all women. Uh, White women who are mothers face a a higher uh, wage discrimination than white women who are not mothers. And so for Black women, since we're already at the 58 percent, here you are losing another six cents on the dollar uh, because you're a mom. And these are these are these are the facts. These are the stats in 2022. So. And again, you know, I say the happy black women's equal payday folks, but, you know, some folk today are going to say that. And it's like, that's it. That, that, that is some form of, of action or amelioration just to say it or acknowledge it. Um, obviously, Sister Monifa, that's not enough. So what, what are we doing? What is anyone doing? Is, is anyone taking this seriously? Uh, what, what is the agenda to somehow 
urgently address this. Yes. I mean, we really had uh, a monumentous package of bills that were moving uh, this year that would have touched on this uh, very strongly. Uh, They were packaged as the Build Back Better plan, but within it were things like a national child care infrastructure. When you say that, people think that's not, you know, oh, you know, what is that? You know, people, there's daycare centers. I see them. The United States stands alone in industrialized countries not having a public child care infrastructure where moms like and grandmothers like your mother and your grandmother could go and get public child care. In some states, child care costs more than college. So you have the mom and the grandmom and the auntie, they're working to do the rent and pay the stuff. But while they're at work, they're paying astronomical fees uh, to make sure that you and I <laughs> were someplace where we were being taught and cared for. So the child care uh, packages and the bills are something that Moms Rising is still fighting for. There's the Paycheck Fairness Act. We need to look at these companies and open up the books and see where these wage disparities exist and make sure that they don't continue. Um, there's not a lot of compliance with uh, previous laws <clears throat> that were passed 60 years ago. There was an Equal Pay Act. There's not a lot of compliance. So we need a fa- fa- Paycheck Fairness Act would increase compliance on that and make employees really show some equity uh, in, in the books and what's going on. And then last but not least, also in that Build Back Better package was paid family and medical leave. All right. So now if we're the primary um, caretakers and the primary breadwinners, you have to be able to stay home when, let's say, you get COVID or your child is sick and has to come home from school. Again, industrialized countries all over the world. In fact, the United States is only one of four that doesn't have a national paid family and medical leave program. And we get hit with it on both ends. Right? We get hit with it on both ends. We We are the primary caregivers for the children, right? So if if a child has to come home sick from school, we've got to leave the the grocery store, wherever we're working, no pay. They've got to stay home. They got a fever, two, three, four days go by, right? And we're also the primary care uh, care, uh, caregivers for the elders in our community and people who have chronic illness. And so this this, um, paid family and medical leave bill that we were fighting tooth and nail for would cover both of those. It would help protect people's jobs and income when if grandmother that's been helping you co-parent and now she's got to go through some treatment and stay home, you can also have some job protection and some income while you care for your mother who helped you care for your child. These are the types of infrastructure that exist in wealthy nations like the United States. So it's not like we're asking for something (laughs) that's out of this world. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, phrases were thrown around about whether or not this is socialism. And I'm I'm not as as moms rising. We're not taking a position on that or not. But it is it. These are other capitalist countries around the world that have this infrastructure, you know. Um, so it, it is it is something that we know harms our families and makes us less stable. And I want to say it makes um, families less safe and impacts the health of our families. So we, we have conversations about these economic issues, but it doesn't just hurt the pockets. It impacts all those other health outcomes and safety outcomes that we hear about in our communities every day. So the paid and family leave bill, where is that now? Well, we're, 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 we're revving up for next year. You know, it had got wrapped up into Build Back Better and we were very excited about that, but the whole thing didn't pass, right? And so now we're going to go back into 2023. It has more support than it ever has in the past. So hopefully we can um, hold the champions that fought for it the, uh, in the rev up to build back better and push it through. But people should really go to uh, momsrising.org and share your stories. That's how we fight on the Hill and in the state uh, legislatures. We bring the stories of mothers, and we'll bring y'all if you're available out there, to talk about why we need these policies and what is really going on in your families. Because sometimes these lawmakers get there and they're like, oh, no one in my district wants that. We find that even the people who fight against some of these policies have plenty of folks in their district 
that need them desperately. Some of them look like us and some of them do not look like us and um, are, are supporting policymakers that are not serving their own interests. But that aside, you know, we need people's voices uh, as we mobilize for paid family medical leave and for the Paycheck Fairness Act and for a universal child care program in the United States. Can, can I say something? It's, so look, <laughs> a Rem Barber called me last night <laughs> and we had this conversation about um, some of these pieces, all these different pieces of legislation that did not pass and just kind of sitting there and folk want to put them off. Um, Nancy Pelosi announced last week, she believes the Democrats are going to pick up seats. The numbers suggest that. But whatever happens, Monifa, these things that we need, first of all, black women, the very women we're fighting for equal pay for, black mothers are, have kept the Democratic Party in power more than any other single group, probably in the last decade or more. Mm -hmm. And, and even more so even lately, even when white women abandoned Hillary Clinton and elected the, the you know what grabber, black women stayed and, and, you know, were true to what we knew would happen. And that that would be that women would lose their body of autonomy. Black women were prophetic. We saw that black women saw it. OK, so. Why shouldn't. We. Keep the pressure on that, not that you aren't, but I'm saying, why shouldn't. We demand the party to whom black women are most loyal pass this type of legislation, even in a lame duck Congress. Because I know everybody's scared to do anything before the midterms, you know, which I also don't agree with, but we know they're scared. But after November, the second Tuesday or the first Tuesday of November, why not immediately pass these pieces of legislation that you're talking about so we don't have to go through the exercise of whipping up the votes again in a new Congress in January? I mean, is, is that is that not is that an unreasonable request? It's not unreasonable. And quite frankly, if, if you would they say, listen to black women, <laughs> if you listen to us, it'll happen. You know, and we we are also optimistic about the midterms. But what you what we're being sold up until maybe a few weeks ago, like you said, was that it was a done deal that we'll, there's going to be a loss of seats and everyone has to start all over again. Um, I don't believe that to be the case. I'm hoping that. Um, we can still push these forward, like you said, during the lame duck. But I do want to mention something that took all of the air out of the room for us in the women's movement, you know, which was the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe v. Wade. And so now we're both fighting state by state to literally protect the very vulnerable women's lives um, in some states. Uh, some people may have seen Black woman two weeks ago in Louisiana, they said if she continued with her pregnancy, it would put her life in danger and that the pregnancy was not viable. And, and it was a huge debate to even just get her to another state so that she could survive uh, and still be a mother for her existing children. Um, that has really um, taken all the air out of the room uh, in terms of a lot of the focus right now for the gender justice groups. Um, there's been some executive orders that have come down. Um, there's been some state wins, like in Kansas, and you see all women, including Black women, on the front lines. Because we, one of the things we didn't even talk about is that we have a maternal mortality crisis in the United States, and Black women in particular um, are becoming, uh, you know, be, uh, facing um, maternal morbidity and maternal mortality at rates equal to people who live in what they refer to as third world countries. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so these things coming together with forced birth, it's almost like, okay, the dam has broken. And so we are trying to hold back, you know, the flood onto the village and still drumming up support, you know, for these very important family economic security pieces that, that we need to move forward. But when you think about it all together, it makes it even more nefarious, right? To overturn Roe v. Wade when you don't have a child care infrastructure, when you don't have paid family and medical leave for when uh, women bring babies home, right? When you have huge amounts of uh, wage injustices and, 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 and disparities between what people make, and you have a maternal mortality crisis where the, the public health system is inadequate and racist, 
to the point where Black women and Indigenous women are facing uh, mortality at three to four times the rate of white women. So you put all that together, and then you 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 <laughs> you don't allow people to have everything they need to plan their families and to plan their parenthood. So um, it's a lot. I believe in us, but yeah. yeah, we should we should fight through lame duck. But I know right now everyone's trying to get these states to uh, protect the lives of these women. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it, frankly, you you're right. But frankly, it, the Democrats fully backing this legislation even now would I would think uh, ensure even more black women would help them retain seats in the House. That's the thing I don't. I don't get about these people. They, you know, that's the point. I don't understand. Yeah. That's my rage. Uh, yeah. People saw yesterday's New York Times. Um, there's they are more focused on a fund the police bill than these measures uh, that we know keep our families safe and healthy as well as economically secure. So it, it, it's it's a level. I you know I try to keep it down, but. Rage, because these are the issues that, yeah, run on this right now. Run on this through the midterms. You know, stop picking up from some polls that you have and listen to the real folks who've been sending in their stories that have been signing letters, begging, begging for this child care infrastructure, begging for paid family medical leave, uh, begging for equal pay. I, no, I, I, I would agree with that. And speaking of the police, uh, and black mothers, you've been tweeting about this, the, the case of um, Brittany Martin, right? Yes. It, uh, talk to our audience about that. And she's, it, it, she, she's pregnant. Is, is that my understanding? She's, yes. She hasn't had her child yet, right? But she's going to, she's at risk of having her child while incarcerated. Is that the case? She's at risk of having her child while incarcerated. <clears throat> For those of you who saw the uh, insurrection on the Capitol, uh, last year in January, and the the attacks that happened there, and you compare it to the case of Brittany Martin, you know, she was at a protest where she was in a verbal uh, exchange with a police officer. She yelled some things, I don't have the quotes in front of me, and has basically been sentenced to multiple years, five years at this point, um, in prison for something that she said at a protest. She didn't storm into a government office. She didn't, uh, you know, smash windows. She, you know, all it, it is, it is such a glaring example of the race and gender disparities of how laws are applied across the country and in particular states. But it's essentially saying, we don't want you to protest, Black woman. You need to shut up and definitely don't be bold. Don't be threatening. You're not allowed to do that. That's only reserved for white men. Yeah, yeah. Folks, uh, keep that front of mind as well, the case of uh, Brittany Martin. Folks, as, as everybody is um, you know, celebrating the queen, except our friends in Jamaica and Bahamas who are announcing in the past 24 hours they want to break away from the Commonwealth. God bless them. I stand with them. But for all those who are celebrating the queen, we need to take care of our queens on Black women's equal pay day. But here's the irony in that even. Even though, you know, we resist the monarchy, guess what? They got paid family leave. The queen gave the people over there paid family leave. That's right. Hello? So let's just be real about that too. As much problem as we have with that, they got the hookup that we don't have. So as we go, Monifa Bandele, uh, tell us um, what you would like people to do today to celebrate and be active on Black Women's Equal Pay Day? Become active. Uh, we always are telling people, make sure you turn out and vote. Um, do that, yes. And there's many ways that you can go. You can go to momsrising.org. You can sign on to these letters. You can drop in a text so that you can get these alerts to your phone. And we have you call your member of Congress. It will have you calling your U.S. Senator when it is the appropriate time to push these things through. But most importantly, there's links there to share your story. Your stories are powerful. Um, that way people can't lie on us <laughs> about what it is that we want and need. Um, and, and, and of course, on top of that, in addition, get out to the polls, 
Um, I always hate echoing that, doubling down on that to Black women because we already are doing it and, and bringing our families and communities. Uh, but I, I encourage people to follow groups like um, Black Voters Matter um, because there's also some bills happening in various states that are eating away at our voting rights. And we've got to speak out and show up to stand in the uh, way of those. So get active, join us. Um, if you, if you, you, ha you may have, if you don't have paid family medical leave, you probably can't show up to a hearing in the middle of the day. But if you share your story, we'll bring your story to the hearing. Amen. Amen. That's what we need. Momsrising.org, folks, the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at Momsrising.org. Our guest has been Monifa Bandelay on this Black Women's Equal Pay Day. We thank you for joining us and, and happy Black Women's Equal Pay Day, Sister Monifa. Thank you for having me. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. As always, perform an act of kindness on behalf of an elder or young person. Write a letter to a sister brother who just so happens to find her or himself incarcerated. Offer libations to the ancestors upon whose sturdy shoulders we all now stand. And above all, give thanks to the God of your understanding by whatever name you call her and him. All God asks of us is that we give each other love. Thanks for giving MIP love. And please remember to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain.